So the museum exhibit is structured as a straightforward chronology, but we've really endeavored to tell the story of the dispossession of Japanese Canadians through first-person narratives as much as possible. In the beginning, we introduced seven narrators, and it really sets the stage for telling a very complicated story through individual stories. It places the visitor right there with the people who lived it. My connection to the Tagashira family is that I'm Masue and Rinkichi's grandson. I'd like to share something that is quite meaningful to me. It's an invoice pad uh, from the war. And uh, the date on it is 1904, and then there's a, a blank on the, on the pad. And uh, there were hundreds of these made, and of course he thought he was going to be using these, and he was quite successful, so he got a, whole of, a lot of them made to be used for his company. And uh, unfortunately he wasn't able to use them because uh, of all that happened, the hardship that took place. So I used these pads uh, in the early 80s university doing calculus on the back of the pads because there was space to do them. So every time I, I kind of used them, I thought about how hard he worked. And, and that got me to work even harder. When you move into the decade of administration, you'll encounter a series of case files that we've curated with the Ategi family. There's a really striking letter where they've included a map to a secret compartment that would have contained family heirlooms and the letters to the administrators come with this very detailed map asking to please retrieve these artisanal tools. Ultimately, the letter that the Ategi family receives is that their home and boat works had been looted. There was a promise to protect that had really been let down. When I look at that picture of the Ategi boat works on Dyke, Dyke Road, it reminds me of my childhood because I spent a lot of time there. I kind of knew about what had happened. I knew there was another, uh, my grandfather's boat works, and it was gone during the war, but not so much about the depth of hardship the family went through. They didn't really talk about that. My hope uh, is that visitors uh, take away from this exhibit a greater appreciation of the need to listen. Because if you haven't experienced racism yourself, listening is the first step to taking action. What I like people to take away is that freedom is very valuable, individual rights are valuable, and that discrimination for any reason is wrong. I hope the visitors get a sense of the resilience of the community, uh, you know, and that uh, that resilience continues into the, into the present. One thing that I'm really proud of in the museum exhibit is the diversity of stories. Japanese Canadians uh, dealing with the legacy of loss and facing a difficult history, but also the descendants of the bureaucrats and neighbours of Japanese Canadians who have also lived with this story. What I hope others would learn about the exhibit uh, and Masue's story is that it's just one story out of thousands of stories and not just about Japanese Canadians but about other injustices that have taken place in the world. So my favorite feature of the Broken Promises exhibition is the end. It's the section where we ask the question of visitors, can Canada be a just home for all? Because the exhibit is introduced through seven narrators, seven storytellers, and you can follow them through the exhibit, you can find this thread of continuity through all the, even the most complex or most dense parts of the exhibit. And I'm hoping that visitors will feel that they're really walking alongside these storytellers as they go through.